Hi, hello, and welcome to another Beauty Entrepreneur interview. I'm gonna come up with a better title for that. Today, I'm super excited to introduce April Meese. April has been doing permanent makeup for 10 years. So she has a solid business in New York and lives her life in sunny California. How does she do that? Stay tuned and you'll find out. After experiencing a near-death experience in a burning 30-second story in New York, April decided she was completely going to change her life, and she did. She left her business in New York and moved to sunny California with her two twin daughters and her husband. She didn't leave her business behind though. The business still runs. She travels every so often, sees her clients, and then flies back to California to live the life she loves. When she's not doing permanent makeup, April is also coaching women to get their businesses off the ground and into the multiple six figures. This is the milestone that April was able to achieve on her own single-handedly by aligning her mindset with what she wanted out of life. If you enjoy this interview, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. That really, really helps us out to get this content out there for more people to see when they're just getting started. I know it really, really makes a difference, which is why I wanna put out as many interviews with successful beauty entrepreneurs so you guys can see these, binge on these, and get motivated, get pumped, because it is totally possible to achieve your dreams within the beauty industry. Let me tell you something, you guys. Through every crisis, through every difficulty in life, women will skimp on many things but you know what they're never gonna skimp on? Beauty. They're never gonna skimp on beauty. So if you're in the beauty business, it is always a good time to achieve your dreams and get into it. If you're not sure this is for you, watch the interview. April is a testimony that you can achieve the things that you want, that you can have high consistent income on one side of the country <laughs> and then live your life in sunny California. Make sure you give it a thumbs up, make sure to subscribe and leave your thoughts in the comments. Any sort of engagement we get on these videos really helps us out and it makes these, these videos more visible for anyone who's just getting started in the beauty world as an entrepreneur. Hello everybody and welcome to another interview for PMU Beauty Entrepreneurs. I'm your host Marisol Medina and I and today I am joined by the beautiful April Mies. Oh, thank <laughs> Hi you. April. Hello everyone. So April uh, is a PMU artist and she is also a marketing coach for uh, beauty entrepreneurs, I guess specifically uh, B, uh, PMU entrepreneurs as well. Yep. Um, and she has an amazing, amazing story. We were going to start recording later on, but it was just, we got to talking and I just really <laughs> loved her energy um, and everything she's bringing to the table with her stories of how she got started. There's even a fire involved. Uh, <laughs> this is good stuff. So uh, let's get started. Uh, April, thank you so much for joining us today oh and gosh. for agreeing to tell us your story of how you became a successful PMU entrepreneur. So yeah. Marisol, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here and serve in any way I can. Yeah. So April is based in California. She lives in California with her husband and her twin daughters aged nine years. Uh, yeah. And uh, she commutes. So she flies over <laughs> to uh, New York. I don't know how often, but she goes every now and then to do uh, her clients all in a bunch. Uh, and then she goes back and she lives her life in California. Uh, so how does that work out for you, April? Yeah, yeah. So this is the way it is now. Um, it didn't start out that way. Um, I'll, I'll start off how I started. So I was at a beauty convention. Actually, I should say this, that I had a marketing, a spa marketing background and then became an esthetician, moved to New York City. This is from Texas to New York City and was working for a dermatologist. And I was at a spa convention. They were doing permanent makeup. And I said, oh my gosh, I got to have that. And then once I had it, the service for myself, I was like, oh, why aren't more people doing it? So that was in 2003. Mm -hmm. I got started in permanent makeup. And then the dermatologist that I worked for let everyone go because it was the stock market crash of 2008. So in 2009, um, during that great recession, I decided, okay, I'm an esthetician, permanent makeup artist. I'm going to start my own business. And so that's how I, I got started. 
and I had that business and, um, and we'll talk about that adventure in just a moment, but, um, you know, for over a decade and, and, and loved it, but there was a life event um, that we were just talking about where I started to think about things um, about like, you know, when you've kind of, when you're faced, not to make be dramatic, but when you're faced with these life or death events in your life, you think, what do I really want? Right. Yeah. You know, and some people might be feeling this with like COVID, like what is life really about? Right. What, um, what's going to really make me happy. And one of the things that I wanted is I wanted space and I wanted more sunshine and I wanted my kids to be able to run and play. And um, while New York is magical in many ways, it didn't have those things. So we decided to move to from New York City to California. And it was kind of like one of those, okay, we don't have any friends there. We don't have any family there. We don't have jobs there. <laughs> it was like a YOLO, like, okay, we got to just you know, follow our, our hearts and make that leap. And so I was com I'm commuting back and forth. And the great thing about the business is, you know, once you build a business, the clients are loyal to you. So you're able to, you know, go in, do a bunch of clients, um, take a chunk of time and then fly back and, yeah. and be here in, in California with my family. Yeah. So, now, you know, when you, when you first started your, your business, um, you had this marketing background, um, yes. but you, you were telling me that it didn't actually really help you as, uh, as I would have uh, assumed. Yeah. So I did marketing for, I did marketing for other businesses. And the last marketing I did was for the Cooper Institute in Dallas, Texas and Cooper Spa is who I worked for, um, which is this huge destination spa that people love. And the thing is that they have a very big budget. <laughs> yeah. And so, and when you're working with somebody else's money, you know, you're like, yeah, do that advertising and let's do this. And you're excited and doing the marketing. And then I transitioned, like I told you, to be, become an esthetician. But one of the things that I noticed with my own business is that I grew up and, and my mom was on um, welfare when she had me, but she also worked at the welfare office. office. And my parents filed bankruptcy when, when, when I was a teenager. So I had these limited ideas about money. Yeah. And therefore, I always thought, you know, you have to hustle, hustle, hustle to make money. You can't spend money. You need to save it. You, you know, you should do everything yourself. And I kind of, like I say that I duct taped my business. So I wouldn't really spend or invest because I was afraid. Yeah. So it's, it's different when it's somebody else's money versus your own. And, exactly. And, and I think, you know, you, you think about things differently. And I guess another part of the equation was that when you were working, doing marketing at this other company, um, you were probably part of a bigger team, right? So, and then all of a sudden, suddenly you were uh, on your own, a solopreneur, trying to figure everything out, wearing all these different hats, right? Uh, yeah. There's well, no one to I, give it to. Yeah. I think that that's the other thing, right? Yeah. You don't, don't have anyone to really delegate to. So when you get, you know, with it, you know, with the business um, that I worked for, the other spa, yeah, you could, I could say, okay, let's do this. And I would kind of organize it and I could pass it off, you know, partially to somebody else. But uh, yeah, when it's your own, every shiny idea that you have, you're like, okay, now I have to follow through and make this happen. So how was it at the beginning when you opened up and all of a sudden, did you, did you like run into what most uh, beauty entrepreneurs in this space run into that you opened up and then you were expecting to maybe get an influx of clients all <laughs> yeah. of a sudden without doing much and then it didn't really happen? Yeah, I think it's one of those, I feel like it's one of the great tragedies in our beauty industry is that we're almost not taught the marketing. We're like taught, if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. And it, you just have to have great skills and that's the only thing that you should focus on. And while I think that's important, you cannot have a business without marketing. <laughs> like even the best artists have great marketing, right? And then it starts to build and build. But yeah, so I thought, okay, like I'm gonna open the doors and there's gonna be clients. And I was like, hmm, now what? And so then I started doing the traditional SEO. Um, you know, I did blogs, I did the website, I did social media. Oh my gosh, you name it, I did it. I just tried everything, you know, yeah. just trying to get it going. And I think that that also, when I look back, 
was one of my my mistakes is that I was just trying everything, right? It was just a lot of trial and error and I wasn't really seeing results, right? I wasn't seeing what I wanted to see. And then also just to kind of go a little bit personal on my story, um, when I started my business, I was also, uh, 20, 2009 was a really tough year for me because I was battling infertility. Mm-hmm. So I had been let go and then I felt like my body failed me. And so I was kind of like failing in a lot of areas of life. It, it felt like, you know, business and personal. And right. so I struggled for a while, but I did a lot of IVF, you know, in um, medication in vitro fertilization. And I ended up having, like we said, the twin girls, but after I had them, I worked so hard to have them and I went through so much and so many tears and all of that drama that I was like, all right, I can't now not be with them. Right. I just had twin babies and you know, that are going to quickly turn into twin toddlers and now to be hustling so much for the business, it just didn't feel right. Right. So I needed to make some decisions on where to spend my time. So I, like I was saying before, it's almost like you have these big things that happen in life that force you to kind of look at what's important and say, okay, where are you spending your time? And, um, and, and I, I say, sometimes say like, get us out of that, like, I'm fine coma. Otherwise, we just kind of are like going through life and we're not really paying attention to like what's working, you know, get focused and figure it out. Mm-hmm. So what did you do? Like when, when, they were, uh, when they were born, did you take a step back from the business or? Yeah, you- well, so I was actually, so at that point, so, that, so I, I got pregnant in 2010 and I had them in 2011. Mm-hmm. So I was doing um, all of the things still. And then I started to say at that point when I had them, then I was like, all right, I need to figure out systems because I need to have, I need to be able to have time with them. So what is the way that I can maximize my time? Mm -hmm. So I'd look at certain things and I realized, okay, when I would do video, video gets way more exposure. And that's even still true today, you know, and back then we weren't really doing video as much, right? Like that was a, a real rare thing, right? So I would, when I would get up the courage and let me just say, it was so messy. And even still today, like I'll have, you know, I'll fumble over my words or something will happen with my mic or like things don't have to be perfect. I think that's the other thing that, um, that, um, you know, whether you say God or the universe has a sense of humor, the fact that I had twins (laughs) and they're so completely different. It let me see like, you know, I, life is not going to be perfect, right? I'm not going to have, I'm not like having my baby in the baby carrier holding my Starbucks. I mean, I was like lucky to shower, <laughs> but I had this idea of what I wanted life to be, you know, what I thought it should be when I had my baby and whatever, and my drink and those girls in their yoga pants and all back into shape like that. And I was like, okay, that's not life. I got to just get started and get started messy. And I need to make it intentional and I need to show up. And so it's, it's funny how like these lessons come to us. Um, but yeah, video was one of the things that really helped get started in my business. And then the other thing was um, referral partners. Mm-hmm. So I was able to connect with I, um, I, and seek out and collaborate with, um, you know, dermatologists and spas because I didn't have an audience. So me trying to do all of the things to get an audience, I was like, well, let me just get in front of their patients and their clients. And, you know, so I started, and once I saw that that system was working, then I just leaned into it. So I I would connect with hairstylists and other spas, and I would develop this network of referral partners where I was able to leverage not only their audience, but their authority and their trust because their they're kind of coming to me almost pre-sold. You know, when your dermatologist mm-hmm. recommends somebody to you, you're like, oh, this might, be, this might be a good person because you trust your dermatologist. Right. So how did, you, how did you actually do it? Like, did you go in person? Was it like a cold meetup? Because these people, I'm assuming, didn't know you at that point, right? Like right. hairdressers and everything. So did you just show up with your business card and, you know, convince them to bring uh, referrals your way? Did you give them any sort of incentives, uh, financial incentives or what? 
Yeah. So I didn't do financial incentives. I think some people do, but um, remember I had that lack mindset. So I was right. like, I don't, I don't have money to do this. Right. So I was really doing it on the cheap. So I tried several different things because I think that's the thing. You, you don't really know what works until you try it. Right. And so at the beginning I would look for my, and this is what I'd recommend to, you know, um, like I recommend to my students and, and for anybody that's watching, like, you look for your warm leads, right? Or what they would say, you know, sometimes people say that you're low hanging fruit, right? The idea of look for people that you might already have a connection to. So look for your own hairstylist and your own dermatologist and like these mm -hmm. people that are close, right? right? And then you can also look for people that you have a connection to. So when I would have clients come in, um, you know, I, I like it actually start, I actually never thought about, um, tapping into my clients resources until I had a client that said to me, she said, um, you know, the dermatologist I go to, her name is Dr. Chappas. And I said, yeah. And she's, she's like, she's fantastic. And she's telling me all about this dermatologist. I said, Oh, that's awesome. And she said, you know, she's frequently on Dr. Oz. I know you were on Dr. Oz show. And so I think you guys should meet. And I was like, Oh, okay. And she said, I'll introduce you. And I was like, great. And so I went and I met with Dr. Chavez and I ended up being a great relationship and she referred tons of people to me. And then I thought, wow, how easy was that? Like if I, I mean, not to say it's, you obviously still have to do the work, yeah. but if I just had somebody that could introduce us, but it, you always feel like I don't want to burden someone or I don't want to impose or I don't want to ask, but I don't know who has the quote of, um, you have to ASK, ASK to GET, right? I uh -huh. hope I that right. <laughs> but, you know, you have, to, you have to ask, right? So if you ask your clients or even your friends and family, like, do you have a connection? Can you introduce us, right? Oh, that's, yeah. That's a great way to get started. And then I also think there's some other components. Like, you still have to have a solid marketing message, um, knowing, you know, how you're unique, your point of difference, the value you provide, you know, kind of be able to answer objections so that whether you're talking to clients or whether you're talking to, you know, those authority referral partners, you're able to really, you know, sell yourself and your services without being, you know, salesy. Right. So uh, getting on TV for any business or brand is a huge deal and it can really, really make it or break it. Like people who get on Oprah, like suddenly they get millions of orders and it just makes their business, right? So how did uh, you end up on uh, the Dr. Oz show? Yeah, so I did Dr. Oz actually for skincare, not the permanent makeup. Mm -hmm. And I, I, would, I would, at that time, I think it's one of those things like, um, this is where the, the saying, you know, ignorance is bliss. I didn't know that I shouldn't do it. So this is one of those, like, I just had that attitude of, I just got to try, try, mm -hmm. try. Um, and so I um, went about, you know, talking to, you know, people that I needed to talk to, to get myself in front of the, the show and the producers and got on the show. And the interesting thing about that is I do it, it did not help my business in terms of clients oh okay okay it's crazy now it maybe helps in terms of like authority building to put the logo up and so forth yeah. but in 2010 um it, that's when dr oz show was like fairly new i want to say it was just like i don't know like two or three years old i can't remember exactly when that started but it wasn't it wasn't like how it is now right mm -hmm where it's been around for a long, long time. So at that time, they said, you know, you, you, it's not something that you can put it on your website. You cannot promote that you've been on Dr. Oz show. We can only promote oh. you. It is our, um, uh, what do they call that? Um, proprietary property. Uh-huh. Okay. Right? So you That's cannot promote. Yes. And I think things have changed a lot now. I think every business wants it to be promoted as much as possible. But at that time, it could only be on their website because Dr. Oz had to be seen and needs to be seen as the expert. Right. right. So, so at that time, they were like, you, you cannot leverage this. You actually have to sign this big, long wow. contract. Yeah, you feel like you're going to give your firstborn away or something. You know, you're like, <laughs> right. So by you sharing it on your website, then it makes you seem as like, oh, I'm the expert in this domain, and I'm just here on this guy who has the platform. 
Right. And it's their, um, they called it their proprietary. Um, so you, they couldn't have any clips or anything like that. So, you know, I can put the logo as seen on Dr. Oz. And now since then, I think they've like, um, you know, changed it. And so now I can show screenshots and even the video. I have the video of me on Dr. Oz and I could probably post that today and it'd be fine. But at that wow. time, it wasn't that I could leverage it for mass exposure. Okay. My friends and family were excited about it, but it's interesting how things have changed now. Um, it's, it's different than what you think. Uh, but, it, you know, I think anytime you have, like, uh, it didn't bring in the audience, but it, um, but it brought some authority. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So how did you then, um, you know, when you started implementing all of these systems, um, how did you start noticing then um, a positive return on that, uh, on that effort? Yeah. So just like I was talking about referral partners, I had an influencer that came to me and she said, you know, I, um, I want to, uh, you know, trade our services. Well, again, I, you know, money lack mindset. I wasn't looking at the potential. It's not like it is now where I, where most people would be like, okay, great. I was like, um, no, you have to pay for your services. But we ended up having a great relationship. So she did pay for her services, but she uh, put me on her YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. She had 400,000 YouTube followers. Wow. Right. Which I didn't know. Uh, you know, I really didn't know what impact that would have back then. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I didn't know about... Actually, it, it's interesting. Before that, I had had somebody else come to me about... Um, about their following. And she had, uh, I can't remember how many people she had on her following, but when I looked at it, her Instagram, it was all like sexy pictures of herself and her following was mostly men. Yeah, so, so that wouldn't really help. <laughs> so I was like, that is not gonna really be my audience. Yeah, right? that was a good call. Yeah, so I was like, but either way, at that time, I was just still like, you know, I need the money. I can't really trade. I didn't see the value of trading. Like we know about influencers now. Right. I mean, it was still early on, right? Like if this yeah. was 2010, it was still, I don't uh, even think the word. Yeah. There wasn't even the word influencer. Right. right. Yeah. So, um, but I, basically what I started realizing is when I would, um, after that, I would start trading, you know, services with her and, um, leveraging it. So I started realizing, wow, when I do certain things, I'm able to get a bigger return, right? Like you can post on social media a ton. Um, but now, especially now, only 2% of your audience really sees it, right? So that, while I feel like you still need to do that, because it's almost like a website or a business card, you know, back in the 80s, it's like, it's standard, like you have to have it almost to be taken seriously, like you have to have it just to be seen and visibility and seem relevant, it just doesn't have the same weight as it used to have um, before. Like, so now that's why you have to step it up with, you know, that's why I say systems like the referral partners and video and, and better, better ways to get bigger visibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so then what, uh, at what moment did you feel in your business that you had made it, that you had reached a point where, okay, I can say I'm successful. I can start letting go of my money mindset limitations. And um, I feel like I've, re I've reached the top of the mountain. <laughs> or have you? I don't know. Oh, yeah. I don't think that you ever really feel, feel that. I mean, because, you know, what happens is funny because you set a goal and then you get it. And then you're like, oh, okay. Well, what's the next goal? What's the right. next goal? Right? right. You just always feel. And I think the biggest thing is for me, personal growth. Now, I wouldn't say that at the time. At the time, I was just trying to pay the bills, right? You know? Right. Like, I was like, I gotta, I want to um, work and be home with my kids. So the, I, one thing I didn't say is, so I grew the business and what people would, I don't know what people would say is successful. I, I, I'm very proud of what I did, that I was able to grow it to multi six figures while only working three days a week. Mm -hmm. And that was really important because for me, the way I define success is if you're, trading your life for like big riches, right? Then you're, you're going to miss out. So for me, I needed, like I said, I've been through so much to have those little munchkins that um, I wanted to spend time with them. So only working, having that quality of life, which, you know, that's when most, why most people get into having their own business, right? You could work for somebody else, but you want to 
have a flexibility, you want to have more freedom, you want to have like um, more impact and you be able to call the shots. And so for me, that was really, um, and that really is success of having more time with my family, still making an impact on others and, and, you know, financially having the comfort to do what we want to do and, and have adventures and family time and um, those experiences and give back and things like that and then and help others, but also um, having balance, you know, because if you feel like you're stressed out all the time, then that's, um, it, it, it really defeats the, the purpose, right? It's like we get in, we think, okay, I'm not going to work 60 hours or 40 hours for somebody else and you end up working 90 hours for yourself, <laughs> Right. So was it like that at the beginning when you were just getting started? Were you working, you know, a, a ton more than you, uh, than you envisioned you would? Yeah. At the beginning, I think, you know, you're, there's always at the beginning, there's a learning phase, right? So you, you're, you're learning, you want to um, just, you're just, you just want to be a sponge. You want to try things, you're learning, you're testing, you're trying. And I just, because that was the hand I was dealt and, and I'm happy about it, had to be more focused. I didn't have time or the luxury of time to like, you know, try to figure things out. I was like, okay, I got to get serious. So I did do, you know, at the beginning I tried all the stuff. And then when my, my girls were born, I was like, all right, I got to get serious and I got to figure out what works and, um, and make it happen. So about how long did it take you to reach a point where um, your business was uh, receiving profit or yeah, receiving profit? Yeah. Did, did it, did it happen immediately after you opened your doors? Um, it, well, I, it's funny cause I don't want to say it did. Um, I was very, I was actually very budget conscious. So mm -hmm. I did not go and ha open up some big office. You know, I, I stayed within my means, right? So I was able to see profit soon. Um, but it wasn't what, you know, it wasn't like, okay, wow, this mass pile of money I'm sitting on top of. No, right. but, but I was able to. Yeah. You're able to pay your rent at least, right? That's right. So I would, you know, work, you know, if you work with other people and share office space and, and for anybody that's starting out, work with a dermatologist or work in the office instead of, you know, I think sometimes where I see a lot of, um, you know, beauty professionals and even permanent makeup artists kind of go astray is they just dream of like their office and how they're going to decorate it and, and they're going to get all these supplies and all these things and um, brand colors and their logo. And I always think of it, it's like, that's like the wedding. It's the exciting part, mm -hmm. but the marriage is the hard part. Like the business is the hard part. Right. And so when you sit down and do the hard part of like, what's really feasible, what are your numbers, what do you need to get? and say, okay, yeah, I do want that nice office, but let's start here. Let's not buy all the fancy equipment. Not, let's not buy all the gadgets and, and you know, all of that stuff. And the that's core. not, yeah, right. Let's, mm -hmm. let's just start with um, what do I need to be, do to be profitable. And functional and yeah. And right. functional, right. You yeah. know, that's great um, advice. And, Right. Because I think that I talk to beauty professionals are like, I can see it already. I, I know what my, my business is going to look like. And it's all like the tangible stuff that they're talking about. And they're not really talking about their business. The Pinteresty stuff, right? Like, <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Like they've already like tagged. Yeah. Like, the Excel stuff. That's like way out in the corner. Right. Yeah. Cause I'll be like, well, what's your, your, you know, your business plan, like your strategy. Like if you were going to build a house, you'd need a blueprint. Right. So how are you going to get there? They're like, well, I think I'm going to post a little on social media and I, I, you know, I already got my website and I, and, and they're just kind of like, hope and pray <laughs> or right. I call it like spray and pray. <laughs> like they just got to put some stuff out there. And then that's where they're in a panic because then they're like, okay, this isn't working or it's not working like I thought. Mm -hmm. And then, then this is, this is also the tough thing. And so they see what is working for other people. And so they're like, I'm just going to copy that. And that's only like the tip of the iceberg, right. right? There's a whole big iceberg underneath you don't see. And so it looks like, okay, well, it looks like she's doing, 10 stories a day. So I'll do 10 stories a day. And it looks like she's using these hashtags. So I'll use these hashtags, but there's so much more like under the surface that you really need to know, um, to, you know, to make it work. So now most, most people who are watching this are probably going to want to know, um, 
you know, you, you scaled your business to multiple six figures. Um, it took you a little bit of time to get there, I'm assuming, yeah. but you did it and it has remained rather stable, right? Uh, because yeah. it, it, it gives you the luxury of being able to live uh, in California and then fly over to New York, you know, have everyone do a batch of people and then yeah. just come back and live, live your life as you, as you put it before when, uh, when we were speaking. Um, so how then, what was, I guess, the key element or the key combinations? Um, you mentioned video, you mentioned uh, strategic partnerships with people. Uh, was it just repetition of all of those things that eventually uh, just drove you to reach that goal of uh, the multiple six figures or was it something yeah. else? <clears throat> I think it always starts and, and it's one of those things like nobody wants to hear, but it always starts with your mindset. Mm -hmm. So I had, um, I had these, you know, these things that kept happening in my life where I was forced to look at life. Right. Um, because if, if you stay stuck in your comfort zone, you don't change. Right. And so I, w I had these, Pivotal, pivotal moments where I was like, I need to evaluate what I'm doing and I need to um, start, if, I, if when I'm wanting to scale, you need to start to, you know, outsource. And so that's when, you know, at the beginning, I was trying to do it all myself. Yeah. And I was like, you can only go so far and so fast by yourself, right? Because you're limited to your time. And you're, you're also limited to your knowledge. So I had to make those shifts of, okay, if I'm investing in this, it's bringing money back into the business. It's not right. an expense, right? Because sometimes- But that's the scary part at the beginning. You, you know, if you, yes. especially if you have a money, a money limiting belief, you just, you're like, oh, but I don't want to let go of this money because I don't know if it's yeah. going to come back. Right. Because you think I don't, in your mind, you think I can't afford to do this. Right? right. And I was like, I started thinking I can't afford not to. Right. Right. Like I have to, I have to believe that my success is inevitable and then I have to act like it. Right. Mm -hmm. I heard somebody say, cause at that time I didn't have any um, coaches or mentors or anything like that, but I had YouTube. <laughs> right. And so I would listen to like Tony Robbins and all of those, you know, like the gurus and they would say, you ha have to act as if you are a seven figure business. Like what would, a, or, or a six figure business, if this is the case, mm -hmm. um, what would a six figure business owner do? And are you doing those things, right? Which is super, super scary. Like it's so easy to say, but it is right. a whole different ball of wax to do, right? Yeah. Um, because I would have like, you know, like everybody, we all have like that, I call it the inner mean girl that's yeah. like, who are you to do that? And who are you to talk about Dr. Oz? And uh -huh. don't think, you know, you know, all those little the imposter things. syndrome, imposter syndrome, totally big, big, big. And I would say, you know, so every time I would take like one step forward, I would feel like I would want to take two steps back, right. but I would like feel the fear and just kind of do it anyway. I'll speak ahead. <laughs> And then I was like, okay, I lived, <laughs> let's do it. Let's go again. So I kept on pushing myself outside of my comfort zone, mm -hmm. right? I kept, I think that's the biggest thing. So I kept on working on my mindset and saying, you know, when I would hear those things of like, you know, people are going to laugh or you're going to look ridiculous or whatever, or you're not worthy, all of the things that like everybody still struggles with. Right. Yeah. I would, I would say, you know, or, or I would do that and I would just take that action. And right. so I think that, um, you know, that's life rewards action. You have mm -hmm. to, you know, sometimes, you know, we get into the learning without the implementing and you have to just get going, um, to see what works and what, do, I'm, trust me, let me tell you, I had so many failures. I mean, there's like, like I said, and still like, still things don't go right. Right. Sometimes like, links don't work or, or the website goes down and, or, you know, things and you think, Oh, does that look like I'm not professional or does that look right. like I'm not, not, you in know, control. Like, <laughs> not in control, right? right? Like that's, that's just life. Life is messy and beautiful all in the same circle. Right. It's just, um, and I, and I've, like I said, I've learned that I've learned that, um, from having twins. <laughs> yeah. That. <laughs> that's a great lesson. So I've learned that the hard way. So then 
I guess the key, the key to being able to do that and to, to reach that huge, huge uh, milestone um, of your business's financial success, um, I guess, was hiring out, right? Getting team members, because you mentioned you have, I mean, in addition to everything else that you mentioned, but the, the tangible aspect of that would have been hiring out uh, your, and, and forming a team to help you and support you in all the yeah. other areas, right? I think if, like, I think if I was to narrow it down, and again, it seems like so simple, um, but I would first say it, it starts with your mind. Like you have to decide, this is what I want, what is it going to take to get there? And, and am I, you know, am I willing to give it my all to get there? Right. Right. Cause so many people they're like, this is what I, I, I use an analogy and I've got lots of analogies. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's my Texas upbringing, but it's like, they're like pushing on the gas and they're like slamming on the brakes at the same time. Right. Right. And they're like, I don't know why I'm not going anywhere. So they're like, I'm doing all the stuff in my business, but then technically they're actually like limiting themselves, right? So I would say to the audience, like write down, because we all know, like what is the one thing that you need to do right now in your beauty business that you're not doing, right? What is the one thing that you know would help propel your business, like get you to the next level or, you know, get you even, even if it's like, what's that expression? inch by inch, it's a cinch, yard by yard, it's hard. Oh, but, I don't know. You know so many expressions. <laughs> oh, see, that's Texas for you. <laughs> We've got an expression for everything. Um, but um, yeah, it's like, what is that one thing that you know you should be doing? Like right. write it down and then say, now why are you not doing it, right? And it's always going to come up like fear, right? Fear of judgment, fear of failure, fear of rejection. Like it's always going to come down to like those things and then look at how you can do it because whether it's doing a video on social media or having a referral, you know, contacting a referral partner or hiring your first virtual assistant, right? Because I just started with like a part-time assistant, right? I couldn't afford. I was like, I don't have a big budget. I just have, I need somebody to come in part-time. And for you, it might just be virtual assistant. Like what is that small step? What does it look like? And what's keeping you from doing it? And what, what would it look like if you actually started to run your business instead of like worrying about, instead of tinkering with a logo, instead of worrying about like, you know, posting, like, you know, all of these little things. What if you started to really run your business and think of like, the big things that are going to bring in clients. And um, yeah, that's what I would say. Like really mm -hmm. start to a ask yourself like hard questions. Like I ask myself hard questions a lot instead of like, I, cause your immediate answer is like, I can't do it or right. it's not possible. Or I don't but know how. Or I don't know how. Right. Which, by the way, in today's. If you don't know how, just ask. <laughs> no, in ask today's time. It, yeah. It's not an excuse because. There's YouTube, like, I mean, you there's know Google, saying? there's everything. There's so much content out there. Uh, yes. If you don't know how to do it, someone's already asked the same question. Yes. Right? So, so that's not, so that's not an excuse. It's, you know, to say, I don't know how, because you can figure out how it's like, but when you start to ask, like, how is it possible? Like, so for example, if you're like, um, I know I need to grow my beauty business. I know I need to get more permanent makeup clients, but I don't think I can do it because I don't want to spend money on ads, right? Like that's, that's what I hear a lot, right? People right. say like, I'm afraid to, and, and let me just say like, you should definitely have like a marketing message down before you do ads. I think ads absolutely work. It's a bit of an advanced strategy. You have to know some things about it um, or at least be a little bit risk adverse because there's going to be some testing. So you have to be willing to invest some money mm -hmm. that might not come back to you at the beginning because you're testing. Um, but can work great once you get it going, once you have your marketing message and so forth dialed in. And I always say it's like pouring water into a bucket that has holes in it, right? Yeah. If you don't have your marketing message, right? So you, right. you want to make sure you get other things going first. But if they're saying that, okay, that's the, that's the belief. I, I want to grow my beauty business, but I don't want to spend money on ads, right? So how can I grow my beauty business without blank, without do, if you're 
freaked out by video. How can I grow my beauty business without me being in front of the camera, right? So maybe you just flip it and the camera's always on the clients, right? So you're still doing video, but it's not you. Or how can I do blank, you know, how can I grow my business without spending money on ads or just like asking yourself these questions. Mm -hmm. And then your brain starts to go like, oh, well, maybe I could, maybe I could do this. Right. And trying it out, right? Like just being gutsy, going for it. (laughs) Yeah. And, and, and knowing, you know, you're not going to (laughs) die. Right. You're not going to die. Right. Yeah. You you know, you're going to make some mistakes and it hurts. You know, I, I have some ugly cries. You know what I mean? I have the, oh my God. You know, like, what was I thinking? Yeah. Um, you know, but, you know, and there's times like I've, I've hired a virtual assistant and, and they go MIA or, you know, they're, you know, it didn't work out the way I thought. And I'm like, did I not communicate or, you know what I'm saying? Like there's times right. that things, things don't work out, but you learn, right? right. And then you make that decision and then you're now you're this far along. So now you've, now you're like, okay, what did I learn from that? What decision will I make from this point? And then you make the next decision and then you make the next decision. And so, so now that you're, um, you know, you've been in California for about three years uh, and you do, you're also a marketing coach as we mentioned earlier. So how do you uh, divide your time uh, and to be, I guess, to be present in both of your businesses at the same time, right? Because you do have that business in New York um, that needs to have some sort of promotion. Otherwise, you can't get all those lists of people together. Um, So how do you do that? Yeah. So the great thing about my New York business is it's like a teenager now, (laughs) right? So it's still moody sometimes, but for the most part, it's self-sufficient, right? Like I have, um, I have, Clients that will, you know, send me new clients, um, you know, that still come in like, you know, this is my sister, this is my aunt, but I'm not actively advertising it because I don't need to. I still have a a group core. And that's a great thing about, you know, our industry is it is a permanent makeup is, I don't want to say it's invasive, but it is something that's serious on your face, right? It's not just like- It's a big deal, right? You don't, you know, if you get a hairstylist, you get a bad cut, you might be like, all right, I'll try somebody else. But like permanent makeup, you find somebody, they want to stick with you, right? And you develop that relationship with them. So you're giving them a reason to always come back to you, even if it's just for the fact that they've got that like client discount and that they're not um, in full price again. But really it's just also, it's one less decision they have to make. It's already gone well. They already trust you. It's like your friends reuniting again when you see each other. And so, so that's like a teenager that kind of, it it requires some maintenance, but it's pretty good. Like Mm -hmm. it's, it's good. And when I'm in California, um, I'm able to help my students because one of the things that I realized, and this happens with a lot of people is once you hit a goal, you realize like, oh, this is awesome. And you feel good about it. But then it's not, then you're like, well, what's the next goal? Or right. what's, you know what I mean? endlessly satisfying. That's right. It's what's right. the next challenge. And so I, I've had that beauty business now for a decade. Right. So, you know, so the next thing was like, okay, I can help others do the same, right? I can take right. my lessons and my systems and, and help them. And then I also love the idea that, um, you know, the internet helps us reach people all across the world. That's so true. it's not just in my local area. You know, I have a student in South Africa and New Zealand, and I have one in Australia and UK and, and of course, US and Canada. And it's just, it feels like it lights me up more, right? Because right. it feels like I'm really making a bigger impact. Um, but this, this new business is still kind of like in its toddler stage, right? Right. You know, past the infant, but definitely still a handful. Right. Yeah. <laughs> at times, right? And so I think what you have to do is anytime you're juggling two things. So let me make this relevant for anybody that might be watching. Like they might be working a nine to five and they might be working their um, beauty business on the side. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's super common. Right. So here, this is obviously what pays the bills. Right. It's not what lights you up and it's not what you're passionate about. And so you have to uh, be mindful that, anything that you're doing on this side is with full focus and full in, um, intention, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm big on to-do list, but I have to say that I put a lot of things on that to-do list and I get a fraction of them done, which is like most people. Yeah. But I, 
I like to then go through and write down, like after I write it down, I'll write like cross things out. I'll be like, okay, circle, I like and star. And I'll be like, these three things, right? This right. is the number one thing today. And then if I can get these two, then great, you know, and I try to also do it um, in terms of like, I've been doing this lately. Um, I haven't always been this way. And trust me, I fall off in slack and whatever, but I'll say, okay, one, some, something for business, something personal and something for family. Oh, that's nice. So is yes. it one thing for each category? Yeah. So I do like, like I, you know, did do, a, I'll do a jog in the morning and then I'll, that's my time to kind of like be in nature and listen to something motivational and just feel like I'm taking care of myself and feel mm -hmm. good. I'll come back and I'd like it in the morning or if I get up early enough, um, I'm not an early bird, but if I do get up <laughs> early enough, <laughs> if I do get up early enough, I'll try to do a little bit of work, but I usually like to like start with that like morning when I have energy. Cause I just, I'll get up and just like a routine, I'll put my shoes on. Cause if I don't, if I wait, it won't get done. Right. So, so I'll do that. Um, and so then I'll, I'll do something business. And then usually my kids are like, you know, mommy, can you paint my toenails or, you know, like, right. like, yeah. Can you play dolls with me or something like that? And right. so then I'm able to like have that time. And then I feel good at the end. Cause I'm like, I feel like I've checked those boxes right. and, um, and in the end, like it's, it's really just about that, that quality of, of time. And I guess also, like you mentioned it, my girls are nine. So I'm really mindful of the fact that I don't want to miss this time. Right. That this, I'm saying this, like this pre teenage time. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> right. Because like, uh, not that they're going to be horrible when they're teenagers, but they're, it's just such a sweet. They still want to hang out with you at, the, at this That's time. That's right. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm still all right. I wouldn't yeah. say I'm cool, but I'm still all right to them. Right. <laughs> I mean, like, like they, like, it's just such a sweet time. And so the fact that they're coming and saying like, mommy, will you play with me? It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to, I want to be with you. So, so why um, answer that question? No, I'm not. This is, this is such a great conversation. I mean, I'm having okay. a ton, tons of fun. I'm sure everyone who's watching is also super engaged. Um, okay. but so then I'm wondering, um, and why, why not uh, pick up a permanent makeup business in California and maybe yeah. close shop in New York? Because that would have been, I guess, the most uh, logical thing to, to consider, right? Yeah, yeah. So such a great question. So here's the thing. Sometimes success can hurt you. In terms of, um, you know, if you've ever heard like good can be the enemy of great, it's like I already have such a great business. Mm -hmm. The thought of starting over and building all of that again did not feel as exciting as starting something new ah. and having a bigger impact. Because the, the great thing about New York is I've been able to continually raise my prices. So okay. when people say, you know, that is the goal, right? The goal is you don't start that way. You start right. with, you just, you just want a warm body. You're like, you, you have skin. <laughs> come on in here. <laughs> You're not an orange. Come over here. <laughs> yeah. Not a banana today. All right. Come on in. So, you know, you just, you just want anybody. So you, you, people talk about getting your dream clients and you're like, forget the dream. I just want a client. Right. It's all um, about practicing at first. Yeah. Right. So at the beginning, you're just, you, and, and then you, again, you start to grow and you start to, you know, do all these things. And so you're able to get that authority. And as you get that authority, it kind of snowballs and you're able to raise your prices. And so I've been able to, you know, raise my prices where, I'm able to command that and starting all over here would be a different thing because you're starting, nobody knows you. Right. So you're starting at the top of the price chain. Like, you know, I mean, I guess you could, and then that might be, Hey, that could be another limiting belief. See, I catch myself sometimes. Right. Like, well, who says I couldn't start there? I'm sure I could probably get in with a prestigious um, plastic surgeon or dermatologist that already is charging a lot of money in Newport beach and do that. But um, I, it just didn't light me up the same. So right. it comes down to that, right? Like that's just, that's just it. Yeah. So then why, why did you decide if I understand like you have this passion to in, it, like share the knowledge that you've, sh that you've accumulated after a decade in business um, and maybe more, be right? Because you, you had all that prior, the, your past career in marketing and as an esthetician, um, I guess the most logical choice for someone uh, who's a PMU artist would be to go into training, right? Uh, 
for the skill itself. Why did yeah. you decide to go down the marketing path? Okay, now you're going to get me to spill some beans. <laughs> okay, people. You, now, this might be where we lose some people. But, um, yeah, I felt that a lot of this, I feel that a lot of the schools, now, I know a lot of really um, prestigious, um, integrity, you know, aligned, wonderful trainers. But I also know of a lot that were slimy scammy you know um and just we see that all the time in the facebook forums like every <sighs> single day right there's someone saying oh my training sucked yeah yeah and the thing is about that is i think I, so i i did have some students that i've trained i actually have students that are that are doing well that have beauty businesses but i only ever train them one-on-one -on -one, mm -hmm. and i only trained them um that and i made them do an apprenticeship with me for months after wow um, and so because I, because it's, it's, um, because their success is important to me, right? Like it's, so it wasn't about like, you know, a lot of those are just like about money, right? Like they yeah. have them in, they cram them into a hotel, like two days, you know, microblading. I mean, you can't even learn, you know, one aspect in two days. Like you can't even, yeah. you might just learn design, but you don't even know, you're not going to learn infection control and pigment selection and skin undertones. And you really don't get that full knowledge in those right. two days, right? So I feel like it does them a huge disservice. So it's really against that. And so I wouldn't be able to scale because remember my whole thing was like, I needed to become very mindful of what is bringing back the biggest return on investment? Mm -hmm. Like that has been um, one of the biggest lessons is when I'm doing something, I'm like, what, what is the return on investment? Because lots of things can work. Oh, I got another expression for you. <laughs> Give it to me. I'm writing them down. I'm making a little, a little April Meese expression handbook. Oh my God. <laughs> it's so funny. The free download. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. So you can build, you can dig a shovel. You wait, sorry. You can dig a hole with a shovel and you can dig a hole with a toothbrush, but the shovel is going to get you there a lot faster. Right. I don't know who came up with the idea of a toothbrush, but that is the expression. Uh -huh. So, um, but you know, the idea is, you know, figure out what is like, what's your shovel in your business, right? Figure out what are the things that are going to have the biggest impact. And so for me, unless I was teaching like a big group, which I don't feel like you can really ensure everybody's success. Um, and what I, what I recognized is that there was a real need for, there was lots of people that already had the training, but there was a real need for now what? Like, how do I, how do I make my dreams a reality? Like, how do I make that impact and that income and, um, and serve more people? Right. And I guess that spoke more to you also, because in that, when you do your coaching, then you can also help people surpass their, you know, their money limitations, their, uh, I guess, any sort of limitations that they have, because you you are big on personal growth and because that's also your day-to-day -day journey, right? You're, you're trying to be a better person than you were yesterday. And that sounds right. super cliche, but it's an active effort that we have to do, right? Yeah. And, and I see it all the time with my students and I, and I also see it with me. Like when I look back at my, my younger self and, and um, <laughs> my younger self, no, but when I look back at that, those times, I'm like, you know, you, we can't see the spinach in our own teeth until somebody holds up a mirror and shows you, right? You don't see where your own limitations are until it is like hindsight and you've learned the lesson and you're like, oh, that's, that's what I was doing to hold myself back. Like that's what I was doing to like push on the break, right? right. You don't or until you have a coach that, t that helps you see that, which is the importance right. of coaching. Yeah. When they ask you and, and everybody has it. Like, I think this idea of like women thinking like, Oh, I shouldn't have a coach. Like I should be able to do it all myself is crazy because Olympic athletes, the best of the best. Um, even Tony Robbins, who's a guru says he has a coach, right? Like right. everybody has coaches. So it's like figuring because what they're going to do. And I have a coach, I have a coach now. And they ask me questions that I'm not asking myself. So they're saying like, you know, when I have my limitations, like, well, I couldn't raise my price. And they're like, well, why couldn't you? Right. And then I say, well, because it's never been done before because of this or like I, and then I hear myself and I'm like, well, that's kind of silly. Right. Right. Like, 
when somebody calls you out on your, your self lie, which is just a limited idea entertained. And I didn't make that up. I think, um, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy quick says lie mm -hmm. is limited idea entertained. Um, but when somebody calls you out on that and says, listen, that's, why do you believe that? Like, why do you think that? Like, um, you know, Donna Maynard was one of my students and she believed at that time, we've had several discussions, so I'm not spilling the beans on her. She's actually talked about it before that she believed that, um, if she was giving her services away, that she was a good person. And that if she charged more, she wasn't a good person. Mm. Right. And then we had to have this whole discussion about like the energetic exchange and when people pay, they pay attention and how you're almost robbing them of the position. Like you're saying you can't afford it. Like you're almost um, like not letting them step up to, you know, put their, their and whether it's money or bartering or whatever to like right. be equally aligned in it and have that exchange. And so we had to have like, we had to go through some things and, and ask some questions and then she was able to like get it. And, and now, you know, she's able to really like step in and still give back and still, you know, be charitable, but not feel like it started with the conversation started with, she did seven clients and she only made like $90. That right. Day. I mean, she's, she's feeling like it's not worth it. Right. And there's that feeling that you're not uh, charging what you're worth. And that's, that's a terrible, that's a terrible feeling. It's as if, it's you know, you, feeling. you know, that you can do all these amazing things yet uh, you're flipping burgers at the McDonald's getting paid $8 a, an hour for your time that you know you can charge for more, right? So right. it's the yeah. same feeling. I totally understand why you, you helped her overcome that limiting belief. And that was very nice of you to help her out yeah. with that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just kind of asking like key questions like, well, why do you, because a lot of times it's like the meaning you assign to it, right? So, it, it, so she was saying, for example, she was saying, um, <clears throat> well, if I charge more, uh, in her mind, this is what she was saying, if I charge more, um, then people will think that I don't care, right? Or she was, that's what she was saying. Like she was, assi she was assigning this belief. She was making this mean, like, so for another example, like um, if you go and you do a video and somebody writes a nasty comment, what do you make that mean about you? Yeah. Right, it, it's not true. That person doesn't know you, right? That person, you know, if, if they said that you had three horns on your head, you'd be like, that's so ridiculous. I don't have three horns on my head. But when you they, might know that, but like just the fact that they said it, it's like, do I have three horns on my head? Right. But when they say something totally ridiculous, you're just like, oh, that's so ridiculous. Right. Yeah. But when they say something where you might almost believe it, where if they're like, you're not worthy of being on where you're like, oh, I might not be worthy. That's when it gets to us. Right where yeah. we think that there might be some part of it that's true. But I, that's just like the deeper stuff that like you have to kind of go into. But um, right. it, it's, it's like the real work, but everybody just wants like the fast tactic. Like, just give me the three steps, you know, <laughs> like give me the boop, boop, boop. Okay, and then, well, give me the three steps, April, <laughs> that you would recommend to anyone who's getting started in this PMU business so that they can to grow their business to not just six figures, but multiple six figures, because one beautiful thing, and I'll do a little parenthesis here. One beautiful thing about this particular industry, uh, as opposed to other industries um, that also require more uh, education investment and uh, maybe even monetary investment uh, is that permanent makeup can allow you that, that, that it, it's a very real possibility, even in today's space where you might feel like it's saturated or that, you know, it's old news or whatever, even in today's space, uh, it is very possible for a woman um, or a man, uh, but mostly women uh, to just build out an empire and be able to create amazing things, not just for herself, but for her family as well to change yeah. their, their lives. Um, it, it was the story of my mom. My mom did this and she started 30 years ago and she completely changed my life uh, and her life for the better uh, because she was able to build out and, you know, her business and, and, and get uh, considerable income uh, that she would have gotten if she had done something else. So yeah. that is something I that, that I love about this industry that it, it rescues people, it rescues families um, from, you know, living some other type of life. 
So it is very, very possible. And to anyone who's watching, it's, it, April is an example. You know, she's living a life where she's uh, not being stressed out on a 32nd floor in New York. <laughs> she's enjoying her family. Uh, she's being present, right, for these two lovely daughters that she fought so hard to get. Uh, and then she's spending time with her husband. She's spending time in nature. She's taking care of herself as well. And then she's flying over to New York uh, to do her work and then come back. So that is an, that, that's a beautiful lifestyle that you've been able to build for yourself. And I know that anyone who's watching is going to be like, is going to be thinking, wow, that's amazing. I really want that for myself. So just to condense everything that we've talked about and drawing in from your own experience and what you, you know, the, what you do in coaching with your clients, what would be the three things that you would recommend someone who is getting started in this space to do to become a success story? Yeah. Um, well, it's hard to, to boil it down to three. I, first, yeah. I would say that if, if you're, <laughs> um, the first thing I would say, just, just listening, I loved um, the story with your mom. It's uh, a lovely story because you know, it's like, those are the things that, that build us. I, I always say, if you got into this build, this business, it's because there was a calling, right? I don't believe in coincidences. I think that things, you know, show up in our lives. You know, I believe in God, but you could, it could be whatever source you believe in um, for a reason. And so I want to also say that give yourself like the grace and the space to know that you don't need to compare to anybody else. Like if somebody, ha let me just say, can I just say that I have like a, very small, like tiny social media following, right? Like, I which is great because <laughs> some people feel like if I don't have 10,000 followers, I am no one. I'm not going to get any clients. You don't need to build, uh, you don't need huge superstardom on social media in order to have no. a successful business. Right. 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 So, so just don't think that there's, there's, you know, like there's that expression, like there's, um, there's not one way to cook a turkey. Right. I, I know some people say skin a cat, but I don't like that one. So <laughs> just like when they say kill two birds, I would say feed two birds. Feed, let's keep it nice. Uh, yeah. So, you know, you can, you can brine it, you can deep fry it, you can broil it, you can do a lot of things with a turkey, right? So the same thing, you don't have to build your business one way, like find what works for you. I have a student that does um, open house, like she does events, right? She does small local events and brings people to it and she, it's great for her. She loves it, it lights her up, it brings her clients, it promotes goodwill with her um, community and her other, stu her other clients. Um, and so, you know, find, I mean, I'm gonna say again, if, if you put me through it, I always say your marketing message your authority referral partners, because your marketing message is your foundation, like it all starts there. And then the ways to leverage your time are going to be with your authority um, referral partners and the positioning, which I consider the visibility in your business, which is mm -hmm. for me, the biggest one is, is video. But I, I also say, don't compare yourself to me or anybody else, because listen, I, like I said, I've had lots of failures. Um, I still make mistakes. I still have moments, you know, that I'm like, wow, that, you know, I really mucked that up. Like I could really do like, <laughs> let's do a rewind and let's start, you know, I could do that be day better again. Um, or it, things don't, I don't say things right. Or I'm not an, you know, it, things don't come out in a, an elegant way. Like I'm kind of goofy. I like to have fun and whatever, but you just find what's you, what's people come to you because it, you are unique, right? You do things in a different way. And I think the beauty industry will always be around, right? Since Cleopatra, people are like, oh, but what about COVID? I'm like, pe women will always want to look better to feel better. Yep. Right. People will, all, they've been done studies that even after, you know, 9-11 um, and World Trade Center, like the sale of red lipstick went up, right? Because yeah. people wanted like a quick feel good, like they wanted right. to pick me up. So the beauty services will always be around because it's not just about vanity. It's also about inner confidence. And so find what you give to your clients. Like when you know you give that confidence to your clients, find that in yourself and, and give yourself reasons to show up. And then also I would say, um, before I said, I said the question of like, what do you need to get there, right? With, or what do you need to do with your acting like a six figure beauty business? Like what are the tasks? If you were a six figure business, what would you be spending your time on, right? 
Would you be spending your time on this like low level stuff, this $10 an hour stuff or $5 an hour stuff that you could outsource? Or would you be spending your time on, you know, big things, right? Like how would you be, what would you be investing in your business in that way? But also I would say another big question to ask is what is keeping you from getting there? Right. Right. What is, what is your, what is that story of belief? What is that, um, limitation. And so what do you need to get rid of? What, what story, what, um, maybe it's a distraction. Maybe like you, every you're in a habit of like binge watching Netflix, right. Or, you know, this is us or whatever, you know, the, the popular show is, or, you know, you find yourself scrolling on Instagram for hours and instead of, you know, building your business or you end up in those groups, right. Those groups are like, a black hole. You think like you're going in there and getting information. Next thing you know, you're like, what, where did those three hours go? <laughs> and you could be actually doing something. So what's keeping you like, what are you, what do you need to give up in order to reach that goal? And so like, like I said, just asking yourself like better questions, find what works for you. I could give you my three things. I gave you my three things, mm -hmm. but, but really um, finding what lights you up and go all in on that and figure out where you are pressing on the gas. I know that's cheesy, mm -hmm. <laughs> but figure out where you are, um, you know, where you're getting distracted, where you right. are sabotaging yourself. Like, like, like doing that is going to be like the biggest um, stuff. It's not, it's not the fancy stuff, but it's like the biggest work. Exactly. Wow. April, thank you so much for that. Yeah. That was so amazing. Oh, I don't know about all that, but you know, here, here's what I would say. Listen, I, I say that um, because like I said, this comes from, it comes from the grit. Like it comes from the ugly places and the, right. you know, um, this might be too graphic, but like the bubble snot nose, you know, <laughs> those ugly cries, like I said, like it comes from those parts of like, yeah where you just have to say, where am I, you know, you learn, you learn more from your failures than you do from anything else. And then you, and, and life kicking you and saying, all right, I got to figure this out. And when it becomes, I don't want to say life or death, but when it becomes serious enough, like when you become like, really, this is, this is the last thing that I'll say. It's hard to shut me up sometimes. <laughs> You're like, I thought I'd get off this conversation. I like, like it. I'm, I'm having fun. Okay. When you become committed to it, th there's a Texas expression that says, you know, it's going to be a Texas expression that says, um, the, the, um, chicken and egg show up for, um, at a bar or something like that. I don't know what the whole thing is, but basically it's for breakfast. And they say the chicken was involved. No, wait, did I just, Oh, I said it wrong. Oh, sorry. It's a, a chicken and a pig. Sorry. Chicken and a pig. <laughs> See, this is exactly what I'm talking about. You have to be willing to make a fool out of yourself. The chicken and the pig show up and they, for breakfast. It's a ham and egg breakfast. They say the chicken was involved, but the ham was committed. That'll take a moment to sink in because ham obviously had to give his life. The, I'm sorry, the pig was committed. That's what it was. Anyways, the point is you have to be committed. Like I'm committed every day to feeding my kids right? That's a real commitment. I'm not going to be like, well, I know I should feed them, but I just, I don't feel like doing it today. Right. Or I got really busy today. I'm committed to feeding them. I got to yeah. feed them. So you figure out what you're committed to and you go all in. So ignore that chicken and ham and chicken and um, pig story. Cause that was a whole mess. Just come back to. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Get that. Edit that out. Just come back to this. What are you committed to? And if you're really committed to it, you're going to make it happen. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much for, oh, uh, for being here, pleasure. for joining us. Uh, I'm going to leave April's information down below for anyone who wants to reach out and say hi. Um, and uh, thank you again for being such an open book. I yeah. know that anyone who is getting started is really going to get a lot of value out of this. And thank you for sharing your story with us. Uh, oh, and I'm, I'm so happy, uh, to have met you and, yeah. uh, you know, that you, that you're such a bastion of, uh, positivity in this industry Thanks. and uh, of all the things, the, the good things that make it great. So thank Thanks. you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much out. for having me. It's an honor to be with you. And, you know, I just, this is what we do. Like, this is, this is the real fun. This is the real, I don't want to even say work because when, when it's fun. 
but um, yeah, you know, it, it makes such a difference. Like if I can just help one person, I'm so glad. So glad. Thank you so much. And with that, uh, that was uh, Microblading Hub, Marisol Medina signing off. I'll see you at another interview. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye.